All right, good morning, everyone. And thank you so much for joining us uh, for this technical assistance webinar, introducing the recently released Delta Workforce Program Grant request for proposals. Uh, we're putting our best efforts into creating content trainings and new ways to serve you as best and as fast as we can. And um, given the ramifications and ongoing challenges related to COVID-19, um, I know everyone's zoomed out and is almost tired of webinars, but we thank you for joining us today. Uh, and today we're going to cover the major elements of this uh, recently released funding opportunity for the third round of the Delta Workforce uh, Grant Program. My name is Ari Kangalas, and I'm a program manager with the Delta Regional Authority. I would like to introduce my colleague Alex Holland, Senior Advisor here at DRA. We'll be guiding you through today's presentation. If you have any questions, please submit those in the chat feature located at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we'll take time at the end of the presentation uh, to go through those questions in order. Um, so you can either type those out as we're going through the presentation or wait towards the end. For the next 15 minutes uh, or so, Alex and I are going to give a brief introduction to the 2021 Delta Workforce Grant Program, including award and eligibility information. Uh, next, we'll take a deeper dive into the 2021 uh, DWP RFP, highlighting important sections and scoring criteria. Along the way, uh, we'll be providing examples of how successful round one and round two DWP applicants incorporated one or more of the eligible activities into their proposal. Uh, before we close, as I mentioned, we'll have time for Q&A to address any questions or concerns you have regarding the RFP. Finally, we'll leave you with some additional resources and ways that you can connect with us throughout the application cycle. And so with that, I will turn it over to Alex. Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, just to give you an overview of the Delta Workforce Program, this is the third round of this grant program. Uh, funding availability has remained the same at one and a half million for this funding cycle. You'll notice a slight change uh, in our budget range or funding request range. The award floor is now $50,000. It used to be 25. Uh, and the award ceiling has also increased to $200,000. That used to be 150,000. So keep that in mind if you've applied in uh, previous rounds. Um, but generally the purpose of the program is to support uh, communities who want to expand their job training and reemployment opportunities by aligning those programs with workforce and economic development strategies in their communities. Um, part of the program that we are proud of is providing this technical assistance. So that includes these technical assistance webinars that you're on today, um, as well as post-award technical assistance for successful applicants. So DRA stays with those applicants. Uh, through the duration of their um, grant activities. Uh, DRA also provides some post-award technical assistance for those who were unsuccessful uh, receiving a grant. So if you have some questions about um, how to develop a more competitive proposal in the future, uh, we're also happy to uh, speak to you after the uh, conclusion of the funding um, cycle. So getting started, we um, do have a, um, an RFP that you can download on dra.gov slash workforce. We also have a lot of resources on there from this round and also previous rounds. So I invite you to take a look at those resources. Once you get the um, RFP or the request for proposals, please review that in full, um, as well as those required attachments that we have mentioned uh, throughout. Um, online, we also have our FAQs. Take a look at those. Um, those are, have been pretty popular in the past year, so make sure you uh, review those as well. And then lastly, we have an application portal uh, to apply for this program. This is actually a new portal uh, this year. It is the same link, workforce.dra.gov. Uh, you'll need to register your account. Uh, we're excited to use this portal. We've already uh, have some folks who have registered their accounts and have started applications. So uh, please do that to get started with your application. 
just some logistical details for your application submission. Uh, those do need to be submitted on workforce.dra.gov no later than October 27th um, by 11.59 p.m. Um, I highly encourage you to submit those applications before the last date. Uh, you don't want any technical issues to come up, your internet to go out, uh, what have you. DRA will not accept hard copy submissions, so you do have to apply online. Um, if that is an issue for you, please feel free to uh, reach out to us. Um, but these are the application submission details. Thanks, Alex. And we're going to take just a few minutes to give you a high level overview of the RFP as well as uh, introduce the eligible activities for the program and how uh, prior year grantees have incorporated these strategies into their uh, successful proposals. So you can see the goal here of the program, uh, but DWP takes a long term view toward assisting eligible communities in diversifying their economies by investing in local strategies developed by regional partners. As mentioned, the goal of this grant opportunity is to create a more vibrant economic future and gainful employment opportunities for eligible residents in the DRA region, enabling them to remain and thrive in these communities. DWP supports projects that develop or enhance cross-sector collaboration deliver specific workforce services meeting identified local or regional needs, create or expand workforce training programs addressing high quality employment opportunities, and supporting the delivery of quality, innovative training and workforce services. Again, on this slide, you can see the, the total funding amount as well as the award ceiling and the award floor. And we have had this question in the past. Uh, this funding in this program, uh, the awards will be uh, provided in the form of a grant. So regarding the period of performance, uh, the period of performance for these grants will be no more than 24 months. Um, and that period of performance begins following an official notice to proceed, which is an email that you will receive uh, from DRA. The 24 month period of performance includes all necessary implementation and startup activities. And by the way, if awarded all notice to proceed for all grants awarded under the 2021 program cycle will be made on the same day. So there will be a predetermined date that you need to return all the grant documents back to DRA and that will be listed in your initial grant packet. Here you'll see a list of eligible applicants uh, for the 2021 Delta Workforce Grant Program. This list is not exhausted. Uh, you can get a full list of the eligible entities on page six of the RFP. So among eligible applicants listed on the previous slide, the applicant agency or organization must also demonstrate collaboration or engagement with at least one employer or industry partner and should partner with other organizations serving the economic workforce development and other needs of the community the application proposes to serve. And as I mentioned uh, previously, the goal of this program is, is to allow individuals to remain and thrive in the Delta region. So applicants are also required to demonstrate that they will serve eligible participants who live in the DRA region and must clearly demonstrate that successful employment or training opportunities will not require them to relocate outside of the region as a term of employment. For this program, uh, DRA requires a 15% cost share or match by non-DRA sources. This can either be in cash, in terms of cash or in-kind services, and applications that demonstrate leveraged resources from private entities or employers are highly encouraged. This is not a scoreable criteria, but we do strongly encourage uh, for you to outline and demonstrate that you have leveraged resources from additional partners.
Only one application from each organization will be considered for funding. If multiple applications are received from the same organization, only the most recently received application will be considered. While only one application will be considered per, per organization, uh, applicants can be included as a partner on another organization's application. Allowable grant activities under the Delta Workforce Program include supporting industry-led workforce training, building collaborative talent pipelines, supporting or enhancing industry clusters, and accelerating local or regional economic development. Uh, over the next few slides, I'm going to give a brief overview of each, along with examples of how these activities were incorporated into successful or prior year uh, successful workforce development grant applications. So the first one, supporting industry-led workforce training. Applicants should engage local or regional industry partners to understand their ongoing and evolving needs to develop or expand workforce training programs that address the skills gap that is preventing these employers from filling vacant positions or expanding their operations. Uh, one example that uh, we like to highlight it from uh, last year funding, last year's funding cycle is Missouri State University, their West Plains campus. Uh, they submitted an application to purchase equipment to expand the robotics program for industrial technology uh, as somewhat as a customized training program for uh, regional uh, manufacturing employers as they are transitioning uh, to more of an automated uh, processing and manufacturing process. And so this was a great example of how they worked and met the needs of their local or regional employers and provided training to fill that needed skills gap. Next, building collaborative talent pipelines. Applicants should develop collaborative partnerships between K through 12 education systems, institutions of higher education, workforce training partners, and local or regional industry partners to sustain a talent pipeline that meets the current and future workforce needs of employers and high growth sectors. And Basecamp Coding Academy, while not funded under the Delta Workforce Program, uh, was funded under our partner program with the Department of Labor, the Work Initiative, uh, they are, are a very successful program down in Water Valley, Mississippi, uh, training uh, high school students or recent graduates uh, for full stack software development. And through the work program, they were able to significantly expand their operation there in Water Valley by developing a new workforce training center called Everest. Uh, and in that uh, partnership, uh, they allowed Northwest Mississippi Community College to actually co-locate a satellite campus in that facility to uh, not only host base camp, but also provide additional workforce training and programs uh, there inside this uh, kind of one stop shop in Water Valley. Next, supporting or enhancing industry clusters. Applicants should assess industry clusters, which are groups of interrelated industries that drive wealth and job creation in a particular area. Uh, that exist in their region to create or expand workforce training programs that address the skills gap that exist in these high growth industries and strengthen the economic competitiveness of the region. A 2019 project that we like to highlight is the University of Holy Cross uh, down in New Orleans. They have developed what they call a food science colonology program, which is basically an extension of a traditional two year uh, food science degree, but it's a uh, an agreement between uh, local community colleges, a matriculation agreement to where those students that come out of the food science programs can transfer into Holy Cross to seek a four year bachelor's degree uh, in colonology, which is a more advanced food science program allowing them to meet the needs of the specific niche uh, food manufacturers and test kitchens there in the greater New Orleans region. And finally, accelerating local or regional economic development. Applicants should assess existing data and studies informing local and regional economic development priorities to ensure the proposed project advances local or regional economies. Uh, and this program we like to highlight through the Research Park Corporation down in Louisiana. They were awarded both in 2019 and 2020 for their Apprenti Louisiana program. And so what they've done 
through in both awards is expand really expand the capacity and outreach of that program to establish apprenticeship program in IT based uh, employment uh, and job opportunities to increase those industry partnerships in that specific target sector uh, there in Louisiana. So I know we've covered a lot of information, but now you have somewhat of an introduction and a flavor to the RFP and successful 2019 and 2020 project examples. Uh, from here, we're going to transition into a section by section discussion of the RFP and review the requirements and contents of a comp competitive proposal. As a reminder, applicants must serve workers in one of the more one or more of the following three targeted categories: new entrants to the workforce, dislocated workers, and or incumbent workers. And so again, just to reiterate, uh, here are the allowable grant activities. And from here, we will uh, dive into the scorable criteria for this RFP. The total, uh, the total points allowable for this year's uh, scoring criteria are 100 points. And the project narrative is, uh, is comprised of the five sections you see here. The project narrative must demonstrate the applicant's capability to implement the grant project in accordance with the provisions of the RFP. It must provide a comprehensive framework and description of all aspects of the proposed project. It must be succinct, self-explanatory, and well-organized so that reviewers can understand the proposed project. The project narrative must describe all planned activities and their implementation, describe how planned activities address the needs and challenges described in the statement of need, Describe how planned activities address the skills gap in the proposed service area, meet employers' documented needs, overcome challenges to serve the proposed target population, and ensure project activities are described in the budget narrative. All right, so we're going to jump into the um, meat of this proposal and walk through section by section um, what needs to be included in your application. And we're going to do this by using the um, scoring criteria. I do want to address first uh, one question that we had in the chat, just so everyone is aware. Uh, the question was, can funds be used for equipment only or can it be used for salaries of instructors? And I just want to uh, mention that uh, funds can be used for both. Um, you, you will notice that we don't spell out um, all of the things that are activities that can occur with these funds. We tried to provide as much flexibility as possible uh, with this program, but both of those are absolutely uh, acceptable grant activities. So for the project information section, if you're following along in the RFP, that's great. If not, I'll try to do my best to walk through each of these sections with you. This is the uh, bulk of your application. It is 100 points total. This section is worth 60 points alone, um, and it is comprised of the project description, which is worth 25 points, project rationale, which is worth 25 points, project team and relevant experience, five points, and local and regional collaboration, five points. I'm going to walk through each of these um, sections uh, one by one um, so you get an understanding of what they break down to, but keep all of these in mind as you're completing your application. For the uh, project description, which is worth 25 points, you'll see we've got four uh, sections here. Um, the first being the description of the project service area and community needs, that is worth seven points. If you're following along on the RFP, that is on page 11. Uh, essentially, this is the area where you as the applicant describe the project service area, 
uh, your community needs as well as the target population to be served by the proposed project. So one of those types of workers or participants um, that Ari went through uh, previously, that being new entrants to the workforce, dislocated workers or incumbent workers uh, should be mentioned in this uh, section, um, as well as any other specialized populations that you might be working with. Um, one might be the formerly incarcerated population, another might be those that might be suffering from substance use disorder. Um, in this section, you should describe the service areas, socioeconomic and workforce challenges. Um, some of the things that we do call out is uh, the service areas population, the median household income, unemployment rate and labor force participation rate. And then lastly, we want you to describe how uh, the applicant plans to recruit the target population. So it's not enough to say this is who we are going to serve, but how are we going to then reach out to that uh, population and recruit them for this program? Um, and then finally, uh, you should describe the specific workforce needs of local or regional employers, job seekers and workers, and how those needs are going to be addressed by the proposed project. There is additional um, room in the application for you to go into the workforce needs a little more specifically. This gives us a high level idea of where your proposal is going to go. Um, the next section is the project design that is worth 15 points. Um, this is where you're going to tell us how you're going to approach the project, how you're going to implement it. This is the uh, toughest section to uh, complete, um, mainly because we need this to be as coherent as possible. We wanna talk about um, our, our project in its, entire, in its entirety, but we really need to get an understanding of how you connect the need that you just described to the design and approach of your project. How are you actually then going to carry this out? Um, and so describe all your grant activities um, that's going to be uh, implemented throughout your program. And then this section really needs to tie into and be reflected in your work plan, your project timeline, uh, the budget and budget narrative. So just be mindful of that. The last thing um, that you do need to include here is a um, contingency plan. This doesn't need to be um, super dense. What we're really looking for is how you might have to pivot if something like uh, the ongoing pandemic is impacting us. Do you have any options to go virtual um, or any other um, any other uh, contingency plans that you might be able to have with your program and how it might be impacted again by the pandemic and also other uh, factors. The uh, next um, point is the demonstration of inclusion of qualified opportunity zones. That's just one point. If you're not in an opportunity zone, don't worry about it. Um, you'll be able to claim if the project service area um, includes one of these opportunity zones, you'll get one point. If you're not, you just lose one point, but it, it, it shouldn't impact um, your overall score. The last uh, piece here is the demonstration of inclusion in persistent poverty counties or parishes. Um, that is all already in the application portal, so you don't need to do some extra digging. Again, same thing with the opportunity zones. You either get the two points or you don't. If your service area includes one of these persistent poverty areas, um, then you'll be able to receive those two points. All of that makes up the project description section, again, worth 25 points. Moving on to the project rationale, which also is worth 25 points. Um, this is comprised of another four um, subcategories here. The first uh, and the most important being the description of workforce needs. This will be a total of 12 points. And this is where we want you as the applicant to describe those specific workforce needs of local and regional employers as well as the specific skills gap that is being addressed by the proposed project. Um, so we really need to see a connection to those from those community needs, what the employers need, and then what skills are going to be taught and trained uh, or in training these folks in order to connect them to jobs that are available 
jobs that employers are needing to hire. Um, so we just really need to see a robust, a, a robust section um, written here on those pieces. The next three, I would say, are more of your, or the next one is more of your gimme points here. That's alignment with DRA strategic investment goals. Um, and so in DRA's uh, federal plan or regional development plan three, there are uh, three goals that I'll mention here in a minute. We just need to see how your project aligns with one or more of those goals. Um, please be specific. Don't just say that your project does align with these goals and not mention how. Um, the how piece is what you're getting scored on to, to get those three points. So don't let those points pass you by. Uh, the next thing uh, is the alignment with uh, program investment priorities, objectives, and funding principles. Those are three separate things, and I won't go into detail just yet because we have another slide um, on those, but you'll need to show how your program aligns with one or more of uh, those, those priorities, objectives, and funding principles to receive those seven points. The last thing we have here is alignment with local workforce or economic development priorities. Uh, so this is where the applicant will identify and describe how the project aligns with an existing local, regional, or even a state economic development plan or workforce strategy. We know that not all communities um, might have one of those available at the city level, at the county level, or parish level. Uh, but even if there's a regional plan, one example might be your local development district has a comprehensive economic development strategy that they complete every five years. That is an example of a plan that you can use. You can also uh, use your WIOA state plan. Um, just, I'm just seeing a question right here. What is DWP? Delta Workforce Grant Program or Delta Workforce Program uh, is what that is referring to. Uh, moving on to the next slide, I just want to dig into the RDP3 a little bit more just so you guys have some context for that. Uh, so this is DRA's Regional Development Plan 3. This is where you will get three points to align with one of the three or one or more of the three goals uh, mentioned here. The easy one is improved workforce competitiveness um, in the plan itself, which is available online on DRA's website. Um, you'll notice that there are a lot of uh, sub points within uh, that goal. Take a look at that. Don't just say we, you know, our program supports or strengthens uh, the goal of improved workforce competitiveness. Try to dig in a little bit. If you have an apprenticeship program, you'll see some mention of that. If you have a free apprenticeship program, if you've got some, a program that involves some soft skills development or other employment services, you're going to see those pieces uh, within the plan. So again, just be a little specific. This shouldn't take um, paragraphs and paragraphs in your application, uh, but it's still very important to show that you align with the Regional Development Plan 3. So for the uh, Delta Workforce Program priorities, objectives, and funding principles, I waited uh, because it's a little bit easier to see all of these lined up as um, kind of three individual categories. Um, in the application, you will need to align your uh, proposed project with one or more of each of these categories. So one or more of the investment priorities, one or more of the objectives, and one or more of the funding principles. And Ari already went through the investment priorities. Again, these can be found um, in the RFP. And I can get, give you guys a page number as well if you are uh, following along. Uh, but those would be on page three. And you'll also see some examples from previous projects that have been funded if you want to take a look at how those projects um, aligned with those investment priorities. But I want to focus on the objectives and uh, funding principles here. So for the objectives, the ultimate goal, of course, is if we're training folks, we want them to then be placed into a job. So um, showing how your uh, workforce program uh, will provide those types of uh, services to dislocated workers, incumbent workers, or new entrants to the workforce, um, and how those services will then uh, lead to gainful employment, um, hopefully in either high growth industries or high paying industries um, for those individuals. The second is uh, career development. So can you demonstrate how your program provides skills training and workforce development services that can include paid work-based learning opportunities, 
That can include um, industry recognized credentials, whether that be an apprenticeship or, or other, um, or other uh, certifications for those careers. Lastly, uh, strategic investment. Um, this is where we're going to see if you are, uh, your program is investing in an area um, that is either in an opportunity zone or in a persistent poverty uh, county or parish. Uh, we're also looking to see if your program um, is investing in those high growth industry uh, sectors or clusters that you have in your local or regional economy. Um, so again, you don't have to align with all of these, but you have to align with at least one uh, or more of those objectives. Lastly, uh, the funding principles aligning with one or more of these. Um, these are all relatively uh, the same in terms of last year's program, but I just want to walk through those again. Um, so for the funding principles, you need to demonstrate how uh, you as an applicant assess your labor market in that market analysis piece. Um, so we want to see that you are able to use uh, pretty robust demographic data and economic indicators to demonstrate the need uh, for the development or expansion of the uh, workforce development program that you are proposing. And also, how does that support those existing uh, economic and workforce development strategies or plans that you already have in the area? This is essentially your due diligence piece. Um, were you able to do that? And can you demonstrate that you did that well? The second uh, funding principle is collaborative. Um, so we want to see applicants develop cross-sector partnerships. We know that that is crucial for these types of programs. So that can include K through 12, that can include institutions of higher education, other workforce training providers, um, employers are required, and we'll talk about that in a minute, um, and, and also wraparound service providers. Um, and we need to see that you demonstrate um, their involvement or commitment to the program by providing their roles and responsibilities. So keep that in mind. Um, the next point here is evidence of leverage. So this is where you're demonstrating um, local or regional commitment um, from public and private partners um, in the form of resources. That can be financial um, or that can be in-kind resources. One example might be if an employer um, is maybe providing um, one of their employees to provide training as an instructor or a mentorship um, to those that might be going through uh, the workforce development program. Lastly, outcome driven. Um, this is where we want to assess if the proposed project um, is going to achieve short and long term outcomes and how well uh, those are developed. These should be realistic and attainable. We're not looking for the largest numbers. We want to make sure that these uh, figures make sense for your area and they make sense for your workforce development program. One thing that we have seen in projects uh, in the past is that uh, folks will say they're going to train 50 people and that 50 people are going to get jobs. We know that's not a reality. It's okay if you only say half of those folks uh, you believe will get jobs or are anticipated to get jobs um, after the program. So just be really uh, realistic with the, uh, the panelists as they're reviewing your applications. All right, moving on to round out this section of project information. We've got the project team and relevant experience being five points. And we also have local and regional collaboration being five points. For your project team, um, this is where we want to get an, uh, an understanding of who those key members of the project team are. We want you to describe their roles and responsibilities as a part of the project. And in order to receive all five points, um, we need to get an understanding of if if these folks have the relevant experience and the organizational capacity to manage and implement the program. Um, you also need to include staff resumes. So this doesn't need to be, you know, 15 people. This might be your critical three to five people. Maybe it's five to seven people who might be part of the project. Um, and we also need to see job descriptions if you propose to hire. If you don't propose to hire as a result of this program, it's okay, you don't need to include that. But if you propose to hire any positions, please provide those job descriptions so we can see those. We know that your uh, project is more uh, project ready. 
local and regional collaboration um, is the other five points that we have here. I already mentioned that 15% cash or in-kind match is required. This is where uh, you will demonstrate local and regional collaboration with other public and private partners. So for those full points, you need to, again, describe the role and responsibilities of each partner, and you need to identify any leveraged resources. That can be cash, that can be in-kind, that can be other. So um, up to you in terms of what your partners are going to be contributing, uh, but please include all of that information in this section. Alice, can you discuss in-kind donation or in-kind matching for just a moment? Expound on that. Yeah, so in-kind um, might be um, resources that are contributed to the project that might not be financial. Here's an example. If um, a university or a community college has a, a facility that they might typically rent out uh, for people to use, say it's a classroom, and that classroom rents out for you know, $250 an hour, but they're going to contribute that as part of the project and waive those fees, you can quantify that. Let's say you're going to have 20 hours of classroom time, and let's see if I can do some math here on my calculator, uh, $250 times 20 hours of classroom time, that would be $5,000 that they are ultimately contributing to the project. So it's not financial, but it's in kind in that way. Another way might be that, um, again, an instructor might be providing um, their time, or perhaps it's a, um, an employer that has uh, certain types of equipment that might be donated to support the workforce development program. All of that can be quantified, um, or you can just show that those are the resources that are going to be provided. So there's a lot of different ways um, that you can provide in kind. And if that didn't answer your question or Ari, you wanna to add to that, uh, please let us know. Thanks Susan for bringing that question up and thanks Alex for expounding on that. Uh, so next, one of the things we wanna discuss the next section is anticipated project outcomes. And as Alex uh, mentioned, one of the funding principles for this program is it being outcome driven. So the anticipated project outcome section is worth 10 points made up of two sub criteria. The first being demonstration of realistic and attainable outcomes, five points and demonstration of specific and relevant outcomes, which is also five points. So the applicant must provide specific measurable, achievable, and reasonable project outcomes to be accomplished during the period of performance. Uh, to be considered for full points, the applicant must identify outcomes that align with the need, gaps, or challenges identified in the project description. At a minimum, the applicant must include the number of communities served, individuals trained, and industry or businesses served as anticipated project outcomes. So just keep in mind, those three are going to be required for every proposal. Uh, and the application will, this section of the application will be scored on the extent to which the applicant proposes those realistic and attainable outcomes uh, and the specific and relevant outcomes to be achieved during the period of performance. So the next section is the work plan, which is worth 10 points divided into two sub criteria as well. The first being the project deliverables, which are seven points and the project timeline, which is three points. So in this new application portal, which we're going to talk about here in a little bit, uh, this section has actually been included as a uh, as an Excel spreadsheet where you can actually go in and develop those project deliverables and timeline in a spreadsheet format and upload that back into the portal. So the applicant must describe all tasks necessary to complete the project, including identifying the key personnel assigned to each task, the time period for completion, uh, the deliverables that are associated with each task, and the associated budget, uh, budget amount for each task. To be considered for full points, the applicant must provide a detailed work plan for the entire period of performance, which again, uh, cannot exceed 24 months. For the section on evidence of local demand and employer letters, um, again, this is one of your most important sections because it is um, at the heart of this program, which is to be industry driven. 
Um, and so these, uh, this section requires you to um, include letters um, of engagement from the employers. You'll notice the evidence of employer uh, engagement is 10 points. The demonstration of workforce demand from local and regional employers is uh, five points. For the five point section, um, this is essentially where you as an applicant provide evidence of demand for skilled workers from local or regional businesses and those high growth industries in your region. Um, so that's where you talk about the specific skills gap as well. But in order to provide evidence of that, which is the 10 point section there, that is where you provide a letter of engagement from at least one local or regional employer. Um, those letters of engagement must describe the employer's workforce challenges, um, include the specific skills gap to be addressed by the project, and also how the employer intends to participate. So there's a lot of different ways an employer might participate. Uh, perhaps they are informing your curriculum that is being developed if there is new curriculum. Um, perhaps they are providing some instructors to assist with the on-the-job training. Or um, if they are farther along in their workforce development journey, they might um, want to then create a registered apprenticeship program, um, which if any of you have uh, dealt with those can take some time um, and also quite a bit of commitment on the part of the employer. Um, if your application does not include at least one letter from an employer partner, it will not be considered. Now I will uh, say that Again, these employers and that skills gap really need to um, connect with that uh, description of community needs, um, the skills gap that you had identified. If it's just an employer for the sake of having an employer attached onto um, this application, it's not going to score very highly. So please make sure that you um, have recruited employers that are relevant to your, uh, your uh, proposal. Thanks, Alex. And the next section is being, or the last section being funding information, which is five points uh, comprised of two sections, subsections. The first being the commitment of matching funds, uh, which is two points and the budget and budget narrative alignment, which is three points. So as we mentioned, uh, the applicant must provide the total amount of funding being requested from DRA and document at least 15% of matching funds from non-DRA sources. The applicant must provide information about the source or sources of the matching funds, including a letter of commitment from the source or other supporting documentation as evidence. Uh, to be considered for full points under this section, the applicant must provide a categorical budget narrative for both DRA and non-DRA funds and describe how these costs align with the proposed project. For those attachments that I mentioned previously, um, the employer attachments, which you guys are all familiar with now, um, and as Ari mentioned, talking about the uh, budget and budget narrative, you will have to provide verification of those matching funds. So um, we will require you to attach a document. Sometimes that document is, you know, if, if your contribution is coming from, say, um, a, a philanthropic, uh, organization, they might write a letter that says that, you know, X amount is being contributed to support um, your specific program. It might be that you have um, a grant that is already supporting one of your existing uh, workforce development programs, uh, and perhaps you need this funding to expand uh, your, your, your workforce training program. Um, and sometimes you'll have to go back to the funder if it is cash uh, or financial match that you have um, to have them write a letter uh, claiming that those funds will be contributed to support this project if it is to be funded. So please be aware that um, it helps us if, if the letters are more recent, um, if, you can, if you can pull that off. For anything else in terms of in-kind or, or other leveraged resources too that are being um, contributed to that 15% match, um, again, those also need to be um, uh, attached in this section as well. Um, and then lastly, we already went over this, but any staff that will be critical to your project and that are mentioned in your proposal, 
include all of their SNAP resumes. Don't just include one resume, but you mentioned five or seven people. Include all of their resumes. Uh, those should be up to date. And then any uh, folks that you propose to hire um, for this project, please include their job descriptions. Once we receive all of those applications, um, they will be pre-screened uh, to determine their eligibility and uh, completeness. So we just wanna make sure you have everything, all those required attachments, you filled out every section. Then it goes through a very thorough review. So they'll be, um, your application will be reviewed by a panel of three. They are all, uh, all those are scored um, individually against those elements that we've just gone through in the RFP that is under section F. Um, so you've got uh, three different folks looking at it. Those scores will then be uh, compared and, and, and discussed and then averaged out against all of the others. Um, so generally the um, highest scoring applications are the ones that are selected. And then there's also some consideration of, of geographic distribution of these awards. Um, total number of grants awarded will depend on the number of competitive applications and the amounts requested. So generally um, anywhere between eight to 14 uh, awards are made um, any given year. That will depend and that might change slightly with the new um, funding range that we have this year. Perfect. Thanks, Alex. And so now, uh, as Alex and, and I both mentioned throughout the presentation, we have a new uh, workforce uh, portal uh, or grant app, workforce grant application portal that'll be utilized that you'll be utilizing this year uh, to submit your application. Um, and I just want to give a, a quick shout out and kudos to Susan Edwards, who's a part of our team who has worked tirelessly to help develop this new portal and get this up and, and running. So I just want to say a, a big thank you to her. And everything you see here is, is due to all of her hard work uh, and, and dedication to, to getting us up in, in a better position. So when you go to workforce.dra.gov, uh, this is where you will access DRA's uh, workforce portal. And once you arrive here at the landing page, um, unless you've been into, I'm going to assume that this is the first time you visited uh, the portal, you'll want to click the button right there at the bottom that says create a new account. Uh, and then you'll be prompted to enter in your organization information, your information, uh, as well as additional points of contact uh, within your organization that'll be associated with this, uh, with the potential award or the application moving forward. And once again, one of the things we love, or I'll note, one of the things we love about this new portal is these tutorial videos you see here on the right side of your screen. Um, the, they are extremely helpful in case you run any problems or have any questions about setting up an account or submitting your application. So uh, they're short videos. So if you run into any problems, uh, please feel free to check those out, but then also uh, do not hesitate to, to send us an email at workforce at dra.gov. So once you create your account, set up your organization, uh, identify your points of contact, you will go into the application and it will prompt you which uh, grant application you're, you're going to submit for. So you'll select uh, Delta Workforce Program, Grant Program 2021. And from there, you will land on the application page. And this gives you a little bit of an idea of what the application looks like in the new portal. One of the things I will note on this screen is at the top right, uh, you'll see a button that has the, the, the PDF icon and it says question list. Um, if you wanna take a look at every question in this application before you actually go in and start, and start diving in and start typing out uh, your response, you can go up there and print those out and that way you'll have a nice little prompt as you're working through uh, your proposal and putting your thoughts together. In, at any point during the, and this came up a lot last year um, with some folks having issues about saving their application. And at any point during the development of your proposal, you can go to the bottom of the page, the bottom of the screen and click save application. Um, I strongly encourage you to save early, save often throughout the development of the proposal and whatever information you've included in the, in the proposal at that point will be automatically saved. 
Uh, and once you click save, you will actually be taken back to what's called your organization's dashboard. And from there, you can actually pick back up your application and start typing in it again. Uh, one thing I will note is that once you submit your application, so once you click that submit application button, you cannot edit this form anymore. You cannot edit your application. So please make sure uh, your application is complete and you're happy with it and it's where you want it to be before hitting that submit application button. And so, as I mentioned, uh, if you save your application, uh, you will be redirected to your organization's dashboard. So essentially all funding opportunities that you request in this portal will be located here in your organization's dashboard. And as you can see immediately below uh, where it says project information, uh, you can continue right there to immediately start to develop your application, start to type back in your, uh, start to type back in the application form. And at any point again, you can go in and go to the bottom of your form and click save and it will bring you back here again. So that's the end of our presentation for the day. Uh, thank you all so much for hanging in there with us and making it through this webinar. Uh, but with that, we will start, uh, we'll take a few minutes to answer any questions you might have. Uh, Susan, were there any, were there any that we missed that we did not address? Um, yes, I wanna make sure you um, saw the one. It says we're a regional organization that serves 13 counties, six of which are DRA. Does the proposal need to be only for DRA counties or can it serve all areas? Alex, you wanna jump in on that one or you want me to take that? Yeah, no, I'll jump in. Um, as, so long as the majority of your project is serving those who live um, and or work in the DRA region, um, that would be acceptable. We just want most of the focus to be that uh, individuals in the DRA region can get trained and continue to live and work um, in the region. Ari, you might have some additional thoughts on that. No, I think, I think that's perfect. Thanks, Alex. Okay. Uh, um, go ahead, Susan, I'm sorry. Okay, our next question is, do you have an idea when this will be announced? Should the project, be, should the project beginning in this year or 2022? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so as I mentioned a little bit earlier in the webinar, um, we're expecting, and Alex also correct me here if I'm wrong, we're in the RFP, we note that we're planning to make award announcements in November of this year uh, with an anticipated start date in early December. Uh, so all, and as I mentioned, all that, once the notice to, is, to proceed is issued, uh, that's all startup activities, all implementation activities. So we'll be ready or, or we'll be asking grantees uh, to start their project as soon as that notice to proceed is issued. I will mention but, the only minor complication right now is that DRA is without a federal member or federal co-chair. Um, and generally those awards are made by the federal co-chair. Um, so we are unsure of... Um, when awards will be made, uh, but we're hoping that uh, they will be made uh, on the timeline that, that Ari mentioned. You read my mind, that was my butt. <laughs> um, and I believe Milton asks uh, most, uh, will this be available later? Uh, yes, so this presentation is gonna be available on our website and we're also gonna upload a recording uh, of this presentation uh, along with the slides to YouTube as well. And we're gonna send out that link a little bit later uh, in the day or tomorrow. I'm gonna give everyone just a few more minutes if you have any other questions. Perfect. Well, uh, just want to get, leave you all with some final thoughts, Alex. Uh, feel free to jump in here as well. I just want to thank you all again for participating in today's webinar. Uh, thank you for spending your, a little bit of your morning with us. If you have any questions, um, I'm going to direct you to uh, both the website and an email address. 
So all of this information, um, all the information about including the RFP, uh, the frequently asked questions, all of that, all those documents can be found on dra.gov slash workforce. So there, as Alex mentioned, there are a ton of resources there on DRA's workforce page. Um, you can go there. I strongly encourage you to check out the, the FAQs. There's a lot of good information there. And then also look at some of the prior year uh, information as well. There's some good, uh, good insights you can glean potentially from prior year applications and what some other folks have done. Uh, and then again, if you have any questions throughout the application cycle, have any issues with the portal, portal wants some more clarification on the RFP itself, uh, please send us an email at workforce at dra.gov. Uh, that way, that's the easiest way to get in touch with all three of us. So Alex, Susan, and I at one time. So we all three monitor that email account. Um, if you want the quickest response, probably the best way is to email workforce at dra.gov. And again, uh, we have recording um, we're recording this uh, webinar and we are going to post this up to YouTube, hopefully by the end of the day today, uh, if not tomorrow, at the latest tomorrow, and then we will send out a notification to everyone on the webinar today that those resources are up and available for you to view. Alex, Susan, do you all want to add anything before we uh, end today's webinar? I'm good. Thank you. Nope, just don't hesitate to reach out. Um, to, if you have specific questions about your project, uh, we're happy to help. Perfect. Again, thank you all so much for joining us this morning. Have a great rest of your day. And again, if you have any questions, email us at workforce at dra.gov. And with, I will conclude today's webinar. Thank you. <laughs>